So our, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, uh, this is Dr. Sasha uh, tresk -Hatch. Um He is actually the head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine at the campus Benjamin Frankel uh, in Berlin, Germany. Um, he does uh, transitional management uh, of uh, cardiovascular risk patients as the most important part of uh, his research. He's part of the German Anesthesiology and ICU Societies, the ACTA IC. He's a representative of the Scientific Committee for the ACTA IC, and he's fully certified in transthoracic and transesophageal. So, without uh, further delays, please, uh, Dr. Treskatch, um, go ahead and um, let us know about. Um, the RV punction in ARDS and respiratory failure, please. Yes, thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers. Um, can you hear me well and can you see my slides? Uh, we can hear you well. The slides are good. Okay. So, whatever there was just. Just let me check something. There was just a immediately we pushed part forward. So however, I think we just start. So uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me to this superb uh, um, echocardiographic online symposium in Toronto. And we heard now a lot about uh, the right ventricular function and the coupling and uh, uh, scenarios more or less in the cardiac surgery field. So now. It's my task to switch over to the right ventricular function in ADS and respiratory failure. So at first, here are my conflict of interests, but they will not rely on uh, anything I would like to declare to you in the next 20 minutes. So starting up, I would like to introduce, um, by the help of these two images, uh, the uh, puzzle physiology of ARDS, which can be separated into an exudative, proliferative, and fibrotic phase. I do not want to go that much into detail, but I'd like to emphasize that today's understanding of ARDS incorporates several pathophysiological pathways, which in the end lead to pulmonary edema, endothelial injury, coagulation, and inflammation. This together results in hypoxia, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, hypocarbia, and pulmonary hypertension. Though we have learned that COVID-19 ALES patients may present a somewhat different phenotype, all of the above will cause right ventricular pressure as well as volume overload. Resulting right ventricular dilation, however, will decrease right ventricular contractility and left ventricular filling and cardiac output, thus reducing myocardial perfusion, leading to global heart failure and consecutive organ dysfunctions, which in turn again impacts the right ventricle in the context of a vicious circle with a high motility, as heard already before. In addition, it has to be stated that positive pressure mechanical ventilation stresses the right ventricle by reducing preload and increasing afterload, as seen on the left side of my slide. And moreover, patient-adapted lung protective ventilation with PEEP is mostly needed to optimize lung volume and especially functional residual capacity in our patient, which is correlated with pulmonary vascular resistance. This atelectasis, as well as overinflation, will increase pulmonary vascular resistance and thus right ventricular overload. Taking this together from a pathophysiological approach, right ventricular function must be analyzed in patients with ARDS and respiratory dysfunction, and current recommendations promote echocardiography as the most important bad side too. On the right hand, you see an overview of what may be measured using echocardiography, and I will present you some methods in more detail, others you heard in previous talks. But it has to be emphasized that sophisticated measurements are only possible if image quality is optimal. 
Here, in most of our ADS patients, we have to make compromises as demonstrated with these two images of one of our COVID RDS patients being treated in my department. Please expect rather a low image quality and be prepared for slight modifications of your standard echocardiographic views, whether you use a transthoracic or transesophageal approach, in order to at least get some good two-dimensional images that are suitable for hemodynamic interpretation. Nevertheless, these two studies demonstrate in ADS and COVID patients that on the left side in TTE and on the right side in TEE, measurements in the prone position are comparable to measurements in the supine positions. Thus, echocardiography is feasible in ADS. However, a qualified certified examiner is mostly needed and you have to adapt to the image quality you get. Before recognizing right ventricular failure, one has to thoroughly understand normal echocardiographic right ventricular findings, as we heard before in the previous talks. In this context, I recommend to start with a qualitative morphometric evaluation of two-dimensional loops like presented here. Of course, a lot of quantitative measurements can be performed like right ventricular basal diameter or end diastolic area. But qualitatively, a normal right ventricle is always smaller than the left ventricle, meaning that the right ventricle is able to fill the left heart. Thus, visually analyzing the RVLV index is one easy step to begin with, especially in hemodynamic compromised ICU patients. In addition, if you could get a good view of the tricuspid annular plane, of course, you can measure the tricuspid annular uh, plane systolic excursion, TAPSI, as one of the best surrogates for the longitudinal systolic free wall function, which has been used in frequent amount of studies and is correlated with mortality. Moreover, you can use tissue Doppler imaging of the tricuspid annular plane to measure right ventricular S sign as demonstrated on this slide. Interestingly, if you have a bad image quality, tissue Doppler derived measurements are mostly feasible. Although we already heard a lot about the meaningfulness of right ventricular strain in the previous talk, I would like to confirm these sorts also in RDS patients. Interestingly, from a transthoracic approach, most vendors have now incorporated easy to use strain analysis software programs, which perhaps will help us to detect the failing right ventricular ventricle somewhat earlier than with conventional measurements in the near future. However, especially for strain analysis, you need to have optimal image quality. Now that we have trained our eyes on normal right ventricular function, I hope that you all are now able to immediately recognize all abnormal echocardiographic findings in these three presented loops. You see right ventricular dilation, left cardiac hypovolemia, reduced systolic right ventricular function, look at the TAPSI on the just uh, right image, in combination with the constantly towards the left atrium bowing intraatrial septum. And I think in the middle, you see a nice paradoxical septum shift altogether as signs of right ventricular pressure and volume. However, when we talk about right ventricular function in ARDS and respiratory failure, we also have to evaluate pulmonary hemodynamics as ARDS associated increased pulmonary afterload will stress the right ventricle. In addition, pulmonary hemodynamics are targets of therapy in these patients. Thus, ECHO may help to monitor therapeutic inventions. 
Again, if you are able to get a suitable color Doppler view, you may semi-qualitatively search for tri-speed recreation as shown in these two loops. By activating then the continuous wave Doppler over this regurgitation signal, you can estimate systolic pulmonary artery pressure with the help of the simplified Bernoulli equation. Remember that you have to add the right atrial pressure and invasively measured central venous pressure may be an adequate surrogate. Alternatively, you can measure the diameter or respiratory regability of the vena cava inferior. After exclusion of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction or pulmonary stenosis, Pulmonary hypertension may be suspected if velocities are more than 3.4 meter per second. You can also estimate mean arterial pressure if you are able to get a view of the right ventricular outflow tract, pulmonary valve, and arterial pulmonalis. In this given RDS patient I present here, I used a modified parasternal lung axis and transthoracic uh, echocardiography focusing on the right ventricle. Again, color Doppler as presented on the right side may help to identify these structures. Then again, place your pulse wave Doppler trace into the right ventricular outflow tract and measuring the acceleration time from beginning of the right ventricular outflow tract velocity time integral signal to its maximum will give a rough estimation of the pulmonary artery pressure. The lower the value, the higher the pressure. Combining now the estimation of the systolic pulmonary artery pressure divided by the velocity time integral of the right ventricular artery tract will help you calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance by this given equation. In addition, as a short remark, a right ventricular outflow tract velocity time integral over 15 centimeter mostly reflects a normal right ventricular stroke. However, you can also semi-quantitatively estimate atrial filling pressures by evaluating the position and movement of the interarterial septum. Normally, the septum is in the middle between both atria slightly moving during respiration. During global hypovolemia, the septum will present an exaggerated movement to both sides of the atria due to the low filling pressure. If filling pressure in the left atrium is constantly higher than in the right atrium, the septum will constantly bow convex to the right atrium as displaced here in the presented transesophageal view. Vice versa, in terms of right ventricular failure, the septum will be constantly Bowing convex to the left atrium, as already demonstrated in some slides before, due to the problem that the right ventricle cannot fill left-sided heart chambers. Finally, from a hemodynamic point of view, it's important to analyze signs of right ventricular congestion. Systolic blunting and especially systolic reversal of the flow in the hepatic veins using pulse wave Doppler depict hepatic congestion like presented here on the right. Though my talk was to speak about right ventricular function, I just shortly wanted to demonstrate that echo can help you to optimize your hemodynamic management in those RDS patients. Optimal hemodynamic and especially fluid management is needed as there exist two different hemodynamic scenarios in these RDS patients. On the one hand, fluids may be beneficial to restore RV preload and augment cardiac output. On the other hand, fluids may be harmful if increased alveolar flooding as well as hepatic congestion occurs. To optimally guide hemodynamic therapy, there exist alternatives like transpulmonary thermodilution, respiratory variation of the vena cover inferior, and finally, critical care of hemodynamic focused echocardiography. As you can see in this figure, critical care or hemodynamic focused echocardiography is mostly non invasive, easy to use, and seems to offer optimal reliability in ARDS and especially ACMO patients. Though this figure 
may look somewhat busy. In ventilated patients with ARDS, hemodynamic therapy may be guided only by analyzing pulse pressure or stroke volume variation, RV function as the topic of my talk, the collapsibility index of the vena cava superior with the help of transesophageal echocardiography, and if still in doubt, a controlled passive leg raising or fluid challenge test may be helpful as presented in the next slide. Here's just a short demonstration of the principle of pulse pressure variation. Mechanical ventilation periodically alters the interthoracic pressure, thus reducing and increasing venous return and consecutively cardiac preload. The higher this variation is, the lower is the systemic filling. However, as a limitation, patients need to have sinus rhythm, a tidal volume over 8 ml per kilogram body weight, no extensive lung re uh, resection, and no right ventricular failure. Therefore, as a next step, it makes sense to evaluate right ventricular function as demonstrated in this talk. Here again, just two qualitative two-dimensional loops demonstrating right ventricular failure. And finally, volume responsiveness may be analyzed by the collapsibility index of the vena cava superior. As this vein is located within the thorax, again, mechanical ventilation and the rise and fall in interthoracic pressure will alter the diameter and area of the vena cava superior. Again, the lower the filling, the smaller and collapsed is the vein and vice versa. Here you can see the collapse, and after fluids administration, you see the collapse has uh, uh, gone off, and there is an increase in cardiac index. A collapsibility index over 20% might indicate volume responsiveness in most patients. However, please be aware of a large gray zone. Moreover, please remind yourself that collapse may occur in different directions. Thus, I always recommend to evaluate the vein using biplane views as presented in these images of the echocardiographic morphometry of the vena cava superior in long and short axis. However, as there exists a large gray zone and measurements may take some time, from a practical point of view, according to a publication of my group, it may be reasonable to say the following without any measurement. First, if the vein is small and a collapse occurs, the vein is probably too empty. Volume responsiveness may be positive. On the contrary, if the vein appears dilated without any collapse, like in the situation of right ventricular dysfunction, the vein is too full. Volume responsiveness may be negative except for some chronic cardiovascular conditions. Third, thus, in these and in any other intermediate condition, echo will not help. However, a passive leg raising and or fluid challenge test may be indicated. So, coming to the conclusion of my talk, I just wanted to emphasize that if you are treating a patient with ARDS, respiratory failure, or a venous venous ECMOS, never do this without echocardiography, mo focusing mostly on the right ventricular function. This will help you guide therapy from the resuscitation to the optimization and finally stabilization phase. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, Sasha. That's That was a, a great talk. And thank you very much for such a complex topic about how to assess RV when we have patients in ARDS. <clears throat> thank you.